Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dark down for a while. Hi, Jackie Cation here. You're about to listen to the Dork Forest. You know the websites, dorkforest.com, thedorkforest.com. JackieCation.com has the links to everything. Merch, the new album, my other podcast, videos of me doing stand-up. Dorkforest.com has all the notes and the video that you can watch of this show. Traditionally, I tell you to donate to the Dork Forest, but it is November and December. I ask that you donate to a local food bank because you should. It's, I don't know, you should do it all year, but what the heck. If you are donating to the Dork Forest using the PayPal link that gives every month, you can turn it off and turn it back on. You can do a matching to your food bank and donate to me as well. But all the money that I get uh, from the donations from November and December, I'll give to my local food bank. And so I will get all of that sweet, sweet karma. Other than that, you can buy merch. You can, for Christmas, there's new, there's new t-shirts and stuff, but whatever it is, the Dork Forest, super fun, always available. I'm sure there's things I'm forgetting to say, probably band camp, but let's get into the show. Hey, Jackie Cation, I'm in my garage. We have to talk very quickly because o- Ophira <laughs> Eisenberg has 54 minutes. And I don't know if anybody listens to my other podcast, but let me tell you something. Uh, I love one hour. So six minutes shy is not going to kill me, is what I'm saying. Uh, and, but I love it. Welcome to the program, Ophira Eisenberg. Hello, Jackie Cation. So nice to hear, see you, hear and see you. Yeah, here's Siri, hear and see me. And I have a new album out. People should probably know right now it's only on Pandora. But by the time this comes out, actually, I think worldwide today. (gasps) Worldwide. Yes, congrats. Very exciting. And then um, Staycation is what it's called. And uh, everyone should buy it and watch it for free on YouTube with ads that then I guess I get some sort of revenue. That's right. And then, but nobody's donating because it's November and December in, in the dork forest. I don't ask you to donate because, uh, uh it's yeah, too yeah. Much. Find, find, find a fucking food bank, find a fucking food bank. That's yep. three F's. Um, let's get into your dork or Ophira. O P H I R A E is uh, your handle on all the things. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, there is a woman here. named Ophira Edat who beat me to add Ophira. But, oh God. You know, we, we know we've, mm-hmm. we've had words, but we've worked it out. <laughs> and your last name is Eisenberg, so it's fine. Ophira E makes sense. Thanks. And, and is there an OphiraEisenberg.com? There sure is that I uh, right. have recently been interested in updating again. It was weird <laughs> having a website for 18 months that you're like, I'm, what am I going to put on this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in making this something that you people could use. Uh, but Ophir Eisenberg, one of my favorite comics, by the way, uh, ladies and germs. So uh, people should uh, go find you. your... Uh, stand-up comedy for it is a delight. And I've, I have a new the- album almost done. Oh, really? Yes. When? Uh, uh, who's that coming out with? That's coming out with 800 Pound Gorilla Records. As well. As, as well. well. So just start haunting them. <laughs> exactly. Buy everything they put out. Because clearly right. they have impeccable taste. Impeccable. Kill Martin's album came out two weeks ago. Exactly. My album's coming out on the 16th of November. Yours is coming out hopefully very soon. Very soon. Yep. We just finished. I okayed the artwork. Okay. Okay. Like, okay. you know, which you is said. very funny. As you know, artwork is a hilarious thing right now because unless you are printing albums, pressing albums and printing albums, like you're not going to, no one's making a CD right now. That's almost a joke. Uh, albums, I have a box of them in my Yeah. House. Oh my God. Absolutely. So, and, so, but yeah, so you're just like, it can, the art could be anything. How about my name? Yeah, the art has to be like very, like something that would fit, look good in a one inch by one inch square (laughs) on a digital screen. I like the the apocalyptic scene behind you in your Vancouver um, <laughs> hotel. Your yeah, hotel room. I'm in Vancouver and hotel art, as I've always appreciated your takes on those when you're on the road, <laughs> uh, is always something. A matter of fact, it is. And the, the art actually is a, such a reflection on the place you stay because some t- I stay in a few places where the only art has been the emergency procedure on the door. Oh. <laughs> 
It does. It does. It feels artistic at that level. If that's all there is. Yeah, well, you know, have you have you seen a lot where they're paint? They're doing an accent wall, and they're calling yes. that art. Oh. Yes. So I also this is a very kind of what I'm just going to call like generic hotel but this piece of abstract art although it is just abstract if you look close but from the zoom reflection angle it does look like a depiction of what happened in vancouver much of the west coast during 2020 which is it was on fire it looks like the charred (laughs) remains of a redwood in the foreground of smoke rising (laughs) We, we have a different Rorschach test. My Rorschach test tells me that that looks like a kind of a, a, a Terminator kind of guy, Ooh. or a fi- or a firefighter. And uh, oh, I, and putting uh, it out, and it's yeah. putting out the fire. Glass half full, Cation. Look at you. Hello. Look at you. Ha-ha. But I love, you know, you've probably stayed. I, I you, I know you're out there again. So you're staying in hotel rooms again. Yes, I am. Uh, but I. Every once in a while when I travel, someone puts me in in like a boutique hotel and those ones I hate. I hate it when there's no bath, but there is a guitar. I hate, or... I hate a boutique hotel. <laughs> we are one. We are one. I mean, it's, it's like... not that they aren't amazing. They are genuinely the layout. There's the, You're like living inside the Louvre, but I don't care. Oh. I want it to look the same. I am the accidental tourist, sadly. And it's always and like they're like we're like counter culture. You're like no, you're like counter comfort. Like there's, it's always <laughs> just a parachute for a shower curtain. <laughs> and I, I, this is honestly God. I stayed in one where the art was a yeah. old tax return stapled <gasps> to a wall. <laughs> Okay, I don't know that you were staying in a boutique hotel. I feel like you were in a Super 8 outside. Was there also the artistic bullet hole in the window? Because that's <laughs> yeah, right. what that feels like. Uh, it was a, uh, yeah, it was an H&R block that had a room upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed in Austin, Texas. I stayed in a Super 8 once that had a bullet hole in the window. And I, and I went oh back God. to the check-in and I was like, any other room? <laughs> any other any other room that doesn't have a hole in the window uh because yeah no yeah. you can't do that i stayed in a place i can't remember where it was mm, but they were redoing they had me on the first floor and they were redoing it the exterior so my room had a sliding glass door that in a different world would be onto some little patio but they had covered the outside with uh plastic as if sure. you know, as if you were and painting paper. So it looked like my room had been sealed for a crime scene. <laughs> I was like, I can't. I can't. I don't mean to be a jackass about this, but someone is paying at least $120 a night or something. It was, that's so. like a, that would be a cool thing for a murderer to do, to like just set it up. Hey, I'm just, I know I'm going to murder you, but a day before I like to go and get the room ready for the crime. It feels like, it feels like a monk episode. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. It's of like course I, uh, I think the monk episode uh, was in, he was in Hawaii, and there was a a team of of uh, women who murdered somebody, but they were amazing. They were the women who cleaned the the uh, the rooms, and oh, so yeah. they were they were uh, this crack team that he was so proud of, and then he realized, oh, you're also really good at hiding. <laughs> Murder. <laughs> yeah, but you were extremely skilled in making things look like right. they're clean DNA rather than gone. actually being clean. Yes. Uh, anyway, so we're talking. I'm, I'm excited about it. We we have six less minutes, so let's do this. <laughs> okay. I need to talk about your dorkdom, which you think you were like. I think it. I you would call them guilty pleasures. No such thing here I in know. the dork forest. Thank you. And so what? Kind and and it's books. So it's I books. always have this opinion: if you're reading anything, even if it's, it's amazing, old, yeah, it's uh, Laurie Kilmartin's son hated to read. I was like, but he likes anime, so I was like, what about manga? Because he's also Absolutely. a drawing kid, and now he reads a lot of manga. So and, you know, this is true. Yeah. Many many years ago, now seven. It's not that long. <laughs> uh, but when I went to, I published a memoir, and I remember when the, we were just talking about marketing, and I was like, "Well, I want it to be like this." And it was very much impressed upon me that do not worry, men do not buy books. 
What? Yeah, and I know that's like a gross stereotype, but it is. It's a sweeping statement, and we, yep. of course, know men who do buy books. Yeah. But um, my brother Phil uh, is an avid, avid consumer of, of literature, but all audible. Ah, see? Interesting. Yep. Interesting. So, so yeah, and so I. So men don't particularly buy, uh, they, they don't browse bookstores and just buy. Yeah. And my husband, I mean, there's books all over our house, but for him, it, none of the words are um, not in a bubble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy has a pull list and has a lot of comic books and, and I read the comic books as well because yeah. they are great. Yeah. But um, and then. He got, he, he has books. He has, you know how everybody has that stack of books that they should be reading. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, and yeah. And there's the stack of books that you're rereading, and then there's the stack of books <laughs> that you're willing to now read. Yes, exactly. And it's not the books that you should be reading, sadly. No, this, uh, so that's occasionally. Where, that, that's, anyway. That's the perfect setup for what I'm talking about. Let's what hear I'm it. Reading. What, okay. what are you reading right so now? So this is the thing. Okay, I'm reading. What do you like? Uh, what, this is what I like. I like escapism. I love escapism. And, uh, you know, bef I, I grew up in a world where they we hadn't we hadn't figured out the word triggered trigger yet in the sense that we use it now. Canada? Is that what it, that word? No, I feel, like, okay. I feel like I feel like yeah, like the idea of oh. being triggered as being introduced into like the everyday lexicon. That's like that's okay. got to be a, a decade. New. Yeah. Yeah, that's new. Yeah. So that's that's the word I needed. And <laughs> because right. I like escapism because I honestly want to escape reality. Okay. Like, yeah, I, I can't, I honestly, I understand how all these women love true crime. I can't handle it. It makes me feel deeply sick inside my stomach. Well, I will say this people's definition of escapism, and I've only realized it relatively in the last probably six times I've done a dork forest about horror movies yeah. and books yeah. and stuff is that people who have anxiety and love horror, it actually, for some reason, bleeds it off. And I don't understand mm -hmm. how that happens because for me, it turns out super scary. Can't sleep. Uh, oh my other God. things. Yeah. I don't want any part of true crime because it's too, too, I need it to not be real. I need to not be real. Yeah. I love, yeah. I, I love, honestly. So it makes me a very pedestrian television watcher, media consumer, and reader. But the thing is, is if you think pedestrian, we could, if we wanted to be so judgmental, is to say everybody loves true crime. Everybody loves horror. True. You you guys are the real peds. Uh, <laughs> over here, I'm reading I'm reading uh, 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 space opera and uh, romance novels and westerns and mysteries that all, by the way, end well. Yeah, that's what Bad I like. Guys. I love a happy Bad ending. Right. I don't want uh, I don't want parents dying. I don't want cancer. I don't want <laughs> pets dying. Like, you know why? Uh, Cuz I've experienced right. all that stuff. Like I, I yeah. and, and then I have a kid so I can't have kids getting hurt. Like I need things. I I, I don't want unresolved yeah, yeah. endings. I you know, I want uh, I want things to tie up. And I love mystery. I love okay. detective. I love did you ever, adventure. Did you ever see Homeward Bound with the dogs? No the dogs coming over. Homeward Bound uh, is about Michael J. Fox as a dog and other dogs. <laughs> uh, with, there's two dogs and a cat, and they all have voices. And uh, at the, I was watching it with my four year old niece when it first came out on VHS a thousand mm. years ago. And I was literally crying because I thought that we had lost, spoiler alert, Homeward Bound. Uh, this is a children's movie. I thought we had lost the, the, uh, the Irish Center. And because uh, he was old. And um, oh, no. And um, I'm choking up a little bit here. Of course. But, but all of a sudden he – and so I am literally silent tears streaming down my face. And my four-year-old niece comes over and puts her hand on me. She said, he's okay. He's coming. And I was like, oh, my God. And then he came over the hill. <laughs> and I laughed and cried and we oh, hugged God. each other. Yes. And it was ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> what you're going through right now emotionally is me all the time. So I really <laughs> relate to this. <laughs> Yes. I feel like uh, my tears for uh, my tears and emotions are like so a thin layer of humanity is uh, of, on the front of it. <laughs> so when it comes to entertainment, I like things that aren't like reality. So and I like mysteries. But the, so I was really into Lawrence Block. If you know Lawrence Block, uh, I, I mean, uh, you know, so with his, a W or. Lawrence L -A -W -R -E -N. with a W, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Lawrence Block, B L O C K. Yeah, so I mean, wrote started writing in the seventies, as far as I know, and oh. you know, the I think his first stuff was the 
The protagonist was Matthew Scudder, and he was an al- alcoholic ex-cop working as an unlicensed private investigator <laughs> in Hell's Kitchen, New York. I mean, so many things well, just ticked off just, all the boxes. Just so many so things. Did. So it so did. Oh my god, that's hilarious. So then, and, yeah. So then he wrote another series that I got really into. That's funny. It's light, uh, and it's the misadventures of a gentleman burglar named Bernie Rodenbar. And it's it's very <laughs> witty. It's pretty sophisticated okay. and witty. Uh, yeah. And it's still from like like late seventies and on. Uh, and I, I like it. This is like, he's an accidental detective as well. It's set, set in New York. He owns a bookstore. I feel like you, I too. Do you feel like you would like to be an accidental detective? Oh my God. It's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes I think I am. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes mm-hmm. when I'm at a public setting and I'm able to get close enough to someone to see their phone and re- read their first <laughs> and last name and something about them, I'm like, I mm-hmm. could, mm-hmm. isn't it crazy that I just got all that information? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm more, Wait. that's like me, me on, uh, me being high is just being like, I'm more observant than anyone. <laughs> Harry at the spy. When I was a kid, oh. uh, I lost my mind. Anyway, is his name Reed Ferguson? Is that the name of the character? Reed Ferguson, the box Bernie, set private. At, pro, uh, no, oh. Ber, Bernie Rodenbar is the burglar. But is Reed Ferguson the name of the private investigator mystery? No. Maybe. No, that's it's a different. Uh, I, I literally I just Googled. Oh, and, yes. Uh, so the ones the one for the um, the one for Matthew uh, Scudder. Matthew Scudder. I forget what all the names were. The Sins of the Fathers, I think, was the the first one. And then Bird and Runbar, they're all, they're all like the burglar who blah. So it's like the burglars right, can't right. be choosers. The burglar a is, who... Right. A is for alibi. B is exactly. for burglar. C is for Z- cat in a hat. Yeah. And I like, too, that even though it was written, I mean, and I say this because things that were written, you know, late 70s, early 80s, they can have a specific tone that doesn't feel current, potentially, but I feel like Lawrence Block is pretty curt, and I also love that his partner in crime and his soulmate is a woman who's super smart, and she's a lesbian. So there's no tension there. But right, they, so there's no sexy times. There's uh, no sexy, but she, right, she's constantly doing her own is thing. Is he getting and laid? Does he get laid? Uh, he there really, in the world? really um, occasionally, and it's it's really given a light touch. Yeah. Yeah, which is, I enjoy that myself. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's a dick joke. Okay, so. so uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, now, I don't know how you are with sleep, but I, I feel like I do something called intermittent it. sleeping. <laughs> oh, God. Well, you have you, a child. <laughs> yeah, but it's also, it doesn't have anything to do with my kid anymore. It has to do with my brain. So, uh, I can fall asleep in two seconds. Oh, yeah, yeah. Me too. Do you stay but, uh, asleep? No. That's the problem. Oh. That's the problem. That's There's the, problem. the trouble. Have you ever read a 70s series that was made into a TV series called Spencer for Hire? Oh, my goodness. I sort of missed it, but I feel like I would like this. You would like it, especially if you start at the beginning because they're Writing all – Writing it down. They're literally – there, remember back in the late '60s and early '70s, all of those mystery novels were all 180 to 220 pages. Exactly. Yes. So you're done. All of a sudden, you're like, "Oh, well, that's all that." And he, it's uh, everything I know about Boston, Massachusetts, is because of Spencer <laughs> for Hire. Uh, so everything I know about Boston, Massachusetts, no longer current. Right. So, uh, right. <laughs> and uh, but he has. There's probably twelve. I think. I think somebody is still writing them, but I would say the first 14 or 15 are very good. And, um, and he has, and it is, it's so funny because he's on the right side of history. Yeah. But they're written in, in a very, in a, in a world that we all know about where we're all dipped in white supremacy. So there's a tiny bit of a parade for yeah. what a great guy he is. Right. Right. Uh, and, uh, the guy who wrote him spacing his name, uh, he, uh, cause the, the character, the, the, uh, the, the guy who wrote it was an English professor at like Boston university or something. 
Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's funny you say it because my brain went to, you know, and this was 10 years ago, I read all of them, was Kinky Friedman. Kinky Friedman oh, yeah, yeah. wrote I a I read huge, those about 10 years ago too. Read them all. Loved them. Totally got into them. It was really right. my style. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, and Kinky Friedman, I think, is like on the right side of history. But yep. I think if I were to reread those books right now, I might be like, huh. Okay. They don't hold up entirely. They, they, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, I read, I was in Australia in probably 2005 or 2004 and I needed a book and I, there was a biker dude at an airport bookstore who was buying a mystery novel. And <laughs> like, I was what like, is he having? I'll yes. have what he's having. <laughs> and it was, and I, I have, remembered and forgotten the name of this book and author and series more times than I can tell you. But, um, it is, uh, essentially he is a bouncer in Sydney and he is not a good guy. So it's kind of like, it's a little rapey. He's a, he beats people up. He helps people eventually. He is not a, he's essentially it's, it could be a slice of life of my cousin. I was just like, no, (laughs) Not necessarily. <laughs> and so I only read one one of those, but I have a hard time once I, I find a new author of not at least giving them four or five shots. Books. Yeah. 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 I don't so know the, why. The thing I like about the made me think of it, the thing I like about the Rodenborough Rodenbar series, uh, where he's a burglar, is that I also love that kind of playing with, you know, what is uh what is the good guy and what is the bad guy? And he's totally a good guy, but he knows he also has stolen things for his own right. use. But he's a prostitute with a heart of gold. That exactly. I don't mind that guy. Yeah. I will read that of how uh, over and over and over again. Please tell me that. Is there a blonde one? Is there a brunette one? Is that guy is he <laughs> is he Mexican? Is he you know? I would like right. a guy from India. I don't care. Uh, oh, so absolutely okay. There, so. Yeah, I was I was reading those. I was reading those. I love them. They were really satisfying. Often I would look forward to, you know, oh, it's time to go to bed soon. I get to, like I couldn't wait. Uh, but I also because I was saying that I fall asleep very quick. I it's I need the 180 pages or whatever, because I'm going through things like four pages at a time sometimes. Right. The short you need a short one. And I, so you're and like, I, let something I to, happen before yeah, I and, fall asleep. Exactly. And yeah. just a through line that I don't have to think too hard about, about like, oh, what deep, intense, yet subtle thing happened that I need to remember. It's always, it's pretty straight ahead. <laughs> but then I got to tell you that I had like a pretty intense anxiety attack over the course of the pandemic quarantine. And it was related to the fact that every, as a cancer survivor, I had breast cancer and as a cancer survivor, um, Based on the decisions I made for my treatment, I have to still go in every year for a mammogram and testing. And it sends me out like just I can't handle it. It always just sends me to the worst place. And then it was on top of that COVID and I didn't want to go anywhere that was a healthcare facility, especially with people that were at risk to begin with. Right, right, right. You didn't want to give it. You didn't want to get it. And your head spins and goes worst case scenario anyway. So yeah, boo! And I hate it. And so uh, I do whatever I can to make it. Uh, I wouldn't. I'm not going to use the word okay because it's it's just palatable? Like, palatable. Palatable. Just so I can literally walk in there. I do whatever I can to like make yeah. it that my feet walk me in there. And so I brought my Kindle with me and I was like, oh, it's OK, because I'll read my mystery novel because the waiting rooms just take forever and ever and ever. And you, while, you know, you go in for one part of the testing and then they send you a, it's a labyrinth of waiting rooms. It's like a maze and, and you go to different oh, looking you, you waiting go to rooms. different layers of waiting rooms kind yes, of thing? Yes, a honeycomb oh, of waiting rooms. Boo. And it takes a while. And yeah. I've done it so often, knock on wood, which means that things have been generally positive. I've done it so often that I've memorized and and also observed all the different ways that the honeycomb works. I'm like, okay, that person means this. And if they have a clipboard that looks like this, it means that. And so I'm also obsessed with the workings of it. You are a detective, it. yes. But for, but for my own emotional evil. 
Right, right. You're beating yourself up with it because you're just like, <laughs> yes. oh, well, this means it's not going to happen because they yeah. have the wrong clipboard. That's or right. Whatever. Exactly. Okay. So uh, I was like, it's fine. It's fine. I'm just going to focus on this reading. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't even focus on a dumb, not oh, dumb. I couldn't even it focus was taken, on it. It was it, somehow it got taken away. Yeah. So I went the next level. I've been there. That's blue. So what happened? So then I discovered, I quickly went on a search and I was like, funny mystery, female lead. Because the one thing that is missing from the things that I just mentioned is always been missing my whole life, which is like, why can't the, why can't the woman? I mean, my favorite movie, and I know this dates me and I don't care. And I still watch it seven to eight times a year is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Do I want to be Marion? Yes, I do. But only the first half. Oh, <laughs> uh, why is that? Because that whole ending where she's just screaming, Indy, Indy, help me, Indy, doesn't oh, match right, right. with who she was at the beginning. Right, right. Oh, it's a classic. It's a classic uh, boy director bullshit. It's, it's, <laughs> and Spielberg did it to his own girlfriend in Temple of Doom, right. uh, where she wouldn't <laughs> stop screaming. And you're just like, you can't like her. Nobody liked her in that movie because she was screaming. That's not why you go out with her. You don't go out with her because she screams like that. So why don't you put the thing that you like about her in the fucking movie? I know. Anyway, so how, how yeah. can you have this character who like wins a shot contest uh, in Tibet, yep. punches out her old love, was seconding mm-hmm. walks into her bar? You know, I'm your goddamn partner, <clears throat> and then like devises a a way to like try to drink a uh, you know French defector to the Nazi party uh, and yep. escape with a knife, and then just Indy, Indy, help me, Indy for the last yeah yeah. Unfair. No. So unfair. You're but right. Of course, who do you really hard so, agree? Hard <laughs> agree. So who do I want to be in that movie? Indiana Jones. But I chose Marion because that's all I had. Right. Uh, that's all you have. That's all. That's I wanted. Uh, I wanted to be Han Solo. Speaking of uh, exactly. Harrison Ford. Yeah. I don't. Wa- I didn't even want to be Princess Leia because no. she. No, she sat. The, she was doing tactics. I was like, "There's no fun in tactics." I want to fly an, an X-wing. I want to fly the Millennium Falcon. Get off my ass! That's right. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get this long so, robe off of me and let's get going. I have so, women character uh, books for you, but go. Oh, please. Light, so then, yes. Awesome. Yeah. Send them over. So I attached on to this series, which is the most bubble gummy but it's fun what is it it's it's, now this is the kind of book that you find right under the daniel steel in the bookstore i tried to read daniel steel don't even don't even don't okay don't diss a danielle go okay so (laughs) it's janet ivanovich is the author and it's the stephanie plum series yeah it's i have tried should i try again well so here's the thing Kind of. I think the first one is so enjoyable. So the premise, of course, is that it's a female lead. Uh, this Stephanie has lost her job. Uh, she's single. Her, her like she was. Uh, her marriage fell apart. She's about to lose her apartment. She lost her job working in a lingerie factory or store. <laughs> and so okay. her backup plan is that she gets a job from her sleazy cousin as a, uh, a like some as a bounty hunter for his bail bonds company. So she be in a set set in Trenton, Never. New Jersey. Oh God! All right, yeah. yeah. So and then there's like there's a former ex boyfriend who's a cop, and then there's like a more uh, kind of vigilante bounty hunter, and these both these guys are in love with her. So there's it's also like a bit of a bodice ripper. Yeah, yeah mixed yeah. So, in to right. a sort of action yeah, sometimes, yeah. bounty hunter. Sometimes I like my my romance novels to be all romance and no action, and my action to be all action and occasion. Like I read the Lee Child, yeah. Um, uh, what's his face? Uh, uh, military police one, Jack Reacher. Yeah, uh, because yeah, my totally. mother, yeah, my mother in law gave me those, and I read. I probably read a dozen of them. He usually gets laid around page four forty five. It's pretty quick. <laughs> And and then he keeps moving, and then bad guys get served and murdered. By the way, Jack Reacher. Jack Reacher oh, is yeah. not interested in due process. He is uh, more more interested in oh you're a pedophile. Allow me to murder you. Right. And you're like, okay, all right. And uh, but that reminds I will... me, I haven't seen the last movie. Something I should uh, revisit. I think there's a series too that's actually supposed to be better, but. Um, 
Yeah. But I will say this. So I have, I'm looking at, there's, okay, so there's different things. Yeah. So there's old, there's Georgette Heyer wrote probably a dozen mystery novels in the 1920s with women with, uh, and, and they're, they're like, do you ever see Room with a View? Yes. It's still my so, goal. Uh, totally. It's Room with a View, but with a mystery. And there's probably 10 of them and four of them are good. Yeah. Uh, so you might as well give it a shot. But they were all written in like the 20s, the 40s, the 60s. Uh, so Georgette Hire is really good. Uh, the the spy novels written by Helen McInnes. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. M-C-I-N-N-E-S. She was living through the Blitzkrieg, writing about British spies in the late 30s. So it's 1941, the first one's published. And so it has this sort of, it might be a little too heavy because it has this heaviness. Yeah. She's living through the bombings. Yes. <laughs> and I she's mean. writing about Nazis two years ago. And so. It's wild. Yeah. So a couple of them are good. I had to stop. She wrote some uh, romance novels that were terrible. I do not recommend the Helen McGinnis uh, romance novels. But here, here's what you're looking for. Uh, let, let, let me, uh, 1928, written in the 80s and 90s. There's 21 of them. Oh, yeah. Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. Oh, I started watching those. Uh, it is. There are, the books are better and the okay. TV show is adorable. So there's three seasons of the TV show. The, the books, she, it turns out, is if she, if she were, and I've said this before, if she were a Dungeons and Dragons character, she would be maxed out. She has charisma. She has agility. She has intelligence. She has wisdom. She uh, is rich. She's good looking. She can ride a horse. She can fly a plane. She's on the right <laughs> side of history. Her name is Friday Fisher. And Friday Fisher, uh, I have probably six of her books. I've read 14 of them because I couldn't get them from Australia. So I put them on Kindle. And... Uh, <laughs> They yeah. are awesome. And wh they also have kind of a glimpse, like the last two I read uh, talked about the history of Chinese immigration into Australia in the early teens, in the late 18, well, from the gold rush, because they had a gold rush in 1849 as well, 1850. Yeah. For some reason, right. the earth decided to show us all their gold in 1849 <laughs> uh, in California and in Australia. And everybody was like, Let's go get some of that. And <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Now we move. Now yep. we, <laughs> yeah, rotating. I mean, speaking yeah. of which, uh, you know, that just reminds me that, you know, there's this huge problem in Australia. I think Australia most pronounced just because of the size of it. Uh, we should all become truck drivers in Australia or really anywhere in the world right now because there's all these natural resources and uh, yeah. gas and oil and gold that is, um, has no, I can't get around. It can't get anywhere. Because uh, it's too big. But I, it's so interesting. I knew a guy, and this I digress. And there's no time to digress, but here we go. Uh, I know a guy who, 55, 60 years old, he said, you know what? I'm sick of living in L.A. He was a, he was a writer. He was a TV writer. He's like, I want to be an over-the-road dr truck driver. And he's been doing it. He got divorced. He had a bad, you know, he had a bad, you know, change of life kind of dude thing. And now... He has back problems. I was like, let me tell you something about an over-the-road truck driver. That's a young person's gig. Yeah. To sit yeah, for yeah. 12 hours a day. No, it can't uh, be good for you. That's not good for Yeah, you. that's not ideal. I don't know how you fix that, but it isn't, yeah, it isn't great. Yeah. But um, the other book, and this is a more historical fiction, and is the Flashman series. I don't know if you have ever read the Flashman series, written in the 50s. And All he right. is, Harry Flashman is a terrible person and he always wins. He has given slightly his comeuppance. Like Andy Ashcraft gave me the first Flashman book when we were dating. Yeah. He was like, you, this is an amazing, it's the history of the British. The first book is uh, the, uh, the British invasion of Afghanistan. Guess how that went? Anyway, so uh, much like it went what? every time anyone <laughs> tried to invade Afghanistan. Yeah, you know, so the, one of the th reasons I think I attached on to this Stephanie Blum series, which again uh, is super entertaining, but it is wildly unrealistic. 
And sure. when you are in a state of trauma, awesome. As I'm, when I feel a little bit better, I'm like, what the, come on now. Really? She only eats donuts and cake? Right. And yet you know, she's super hot, super hot. Super hot. <laughs> it's uh, actually, it's kind of funny how they never quite, they just, she just, Describe sometimes what kind of shirt she's put on, but she never describes her body, which I, you know, sometimes you read these things and it's, it's like, uh, you know, she could tell the way he gazed at her was that, you know, was like no woman. It's not, none of that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 Is it written by Janet Ivanovich, right? So it's yeah. written by a woman. It's written by a and woman. As it turns out, her son also writes and I think oh. has contributed to some of her series. Oh, 24 books. There's 24. Right. Uh, I've read, I've read about 10 of, I've read about half. I okay. would say it's still like, it's easy. Uh, there's some, there's some, and it's wearing on me a little bit because the good thing yeah. is, is that it's eccentric. It's fun. It's ridiculous. There's some witty lines. The action is moving. She's also kind of bad at her job. Her car's always getting blown up. Like, oh my God, that's tons hilarious. Of, ex- of, of um, explosions. There's a couple uh, pretty gross, uh, like st- grossly, uh, I guess, racist depictions of some of the characters, side characters. Sure, of course. Uh, Why wouldn't there be? Which, Why wouldn't you know, there be some horrible racism written? Yeah. They, she's, and I'm sure there's this whole weird thing about white supremacism where <sighs> you're like, no, I thought I was being funny. And you're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. we weren't. Nobody was being funny. And I feel uh, like the volume on that is going up in the books. But, yeah. uh, but Oh, the first, really? Yeah. The, the first okay. one especially was like, oh, my goodness, this is such a fun adventure. And then I actually even thought – why hasn't anyone translated this into a movie? Yeah. And it turns out they did, and it was a flop. And it was many years ago, but of course I was like, I got to watch this. And it was terrible. Right. I could barely watch it, which was so, so too bad because I had a totally different picture of it in my head. And it was yeah. starring uh, Catherine Hagel. Oh, I love Catherine Hagel. Kind yes. Of. So yeah. it had a, a p- potential, but. You know, <clears throat> there is, uh, there's a, a woman who I did a, an episode with her, the Dork Forest, who writes their, their kind of young adult. Um, they're set in a world with vampires and werewolves and stuff, but it's the, you know, they're kind of, kind of a comedy of errors and their mysteries and steampunk werewolf mm-hmm. nonsense. Ooh. And it's awesome. Her name is Gail Carriger. And, uh, and it's, it's, uh, Gail Car and it's, and it's spelled Gail Carriger, but she goes with a hard G on the second, uh, G. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, but they're the Paracel, it's like the, the Paracel Protectorate, I think is what it's called. And Hilarious. it's full of like bustles and steampunk and typewriters and dirigibles and, uh, and the, and the vampires are all super cool and the werewolves are all super kind of dumb, but with hearts of gold. <laughs> and it's exactly how I would do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I mean, they're like yeah, dogs. They're kind of like dogs. Yeah, they're dogs. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are literally like dogs where you're just like, no, I, I can help you. No, I, I just gotta, I'll be right back. I gotta go run real fast. And <laughs> they gotta run around. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, awesome. You know what you might like if you, if you like any kind of my favorite series right now the, in the reread world. Yeah. Lois McMaster Bujold. <laughs> she is a Minneapolis author, science oh. fiction. She won a Hugo and a Nebula for the first three. And she does a sort of a gender sexuality thing that I've made Andy listen to uh, probably nine of them now. And he's like, I'm a little uneasy in how she uses the word, this gender word. And I was like, Uh-oh. get over it. She, her heart's in the right place. Okay. <laughs> and uh, she didn't know that it was going to be a they, them world, Andy. And uh, so there was no way to know. But Lois McMaster Bujold wrote, and it's too bad about the um, the uh, the fact that, so the first novella, they're, they're, they're short novels, right? It's called, I think, uh, Shards of Honor is the first one, and Barry R. And okay. they are grouped together in something called Cordelia's Honor. And here's the thing about the words Cordelia's Honor with the cover that is on it. It looks like a romance novel. Yeah. It looks dumb. Yeah. And it isn't. 
So, uh, fuck don't those judge a book by its cover. <laughs> Yeah, I, what I do almost always. Yeah, I'm just like everybody does. Yeah. That's that's yeah, yeah. why. I, yeah, this looks good. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna do this one. Yeah, anyway, that's why so. I spent like nine different passes at a uh, album cover that's gonna take place in a one inch by one inch square. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yes, by the way, talking to Ophira Eisenberg, and it's Ophira, O-P-H-I-R-A-E, uh, on everywhere. And just, uh, yeah, you you get it. Uh, on everywhere. Okay. On everywhere. So, and, and it'll be in the notes. So, I yeah. also, I like these, you know, I, I feel like with the Kinky Friedman and the Lawrence Block, and even this this Stephanie Blum series, uh, the Janet Ivanovich, is that I, I like the fact, it's so funny that you just said this writer you like is did you say you said minneapolis right yeah minnesota yeah uh so you know i live in new york so i kind of love this like unrealistic but yet i still recognize the places that they're talking about Mm -hmm. settings yeah and i don't know trenton new jersey but it's close enough that they talk about new work like i love stuff in a setting too that i'm a little bit familiar with i i had no idea i would be that person it does right, right. It's so weird that that's that that's the jam, right? So, yeah. um, but it is it is interesting because she doesn't set any of them anywhere near Minneapolis. Okay, Lois McMaster Bujold, because they're all space. Though it is <laughs> interesting to say <laughs> that because it literally is space opera. It is like there's big like there's big space battles. There's big hand to hand combat. There is love interest. There's philosophy and, and political intrigue. But it's all you know. Like some people love. Like I love Dune. I just yeah. reread Dune. Dune is written by Frank Herbert, and Dune has this intensity to it that wants to be. It wants to be. The uh, the Politburo in 1967, right? That's what Dune wants to wants it to be. Yeah, I don't I don't want to read the minutes of the Politburo from 1967. <laughs> I would like you to have sort of an overview of the political situation, and then put it in terms of oh, and this. And this, you know, you can make fun of me and just say, oh, well, it's a girl. And but uh, the thing is, is I because it's not that I don't enjoy Dune. It's just that it's not something I would ever read to stop the voices in my head. Right. You know, that is such a great way of putting it. What do you read to stop the voices in your head? Right. And sometimes yeah. when I really have to, like, take in information on a certain level, like I used to really like historical fiction. Yeah. Uh, because I felt like I got a little, a little bit of everything, but then yeah. I just found that that wasn't that wasn't working to do this express need yeah. to uh, basically itch this, scratch this itch, which is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. stop it, stop it, yeah. take me to yeah. a world where we're just uh, eating donuts, solving crimes, and burgling people's houses. And, you know, you're going right, to, right. I mean, right. I love, uh, there, there, I remember in the Lawrence block, whatever, when I was reading of that series, there was like three pages on just how the different locks were being picked. And to me, that was poetry. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was super fun. And you were like, yeah, I need more, not like sort of, it was, and if it's well written, if it's lightly written, you know, and you're just like, no, that's exactly what yes. I want. I do, I do think there is an art and maybe it is not, um, highlighted enough because as I said at the beginning of this, I was like, oh, is it a guilty pleasure? And you, you were very nice to be like, what, you know, what is a guilty pleasure? I said, oh, it's pedestrian. You go, come on, maybe it's all the rest of the people are being pedestrian, but maybe it's also that we D like, I just think that I should be reading things that are highly intelligent and that have non-closure and are basically (laughs) not following like the kind of narrative arcs that we, uh, learn about in grade school. I'm not going to read Cormac (laughs) McCarthy. It's not never happening i'm sure it's poetry but there's just like there's it's this and and some people love it you know like um foster wallace what's his name oh yeah um, david foster wallace sure david uh, i always like george wallace no george foster <laughs> and, uh, so but david foster wallace is for me not the thing to you know i'm just like i know that he's snarky i know that he is you know, that, that, that it's, that it's intelligent, 
but it is depressing, yeah. you know? And when I read fiction, when I watch fiction, I need the hero to kind of win. I need it to, to end. There's pl- I know it's like reality television. Some people love it because it does something for them. Right. Yes. But for me, I already know people that are making terrible life choices. I oh my goodness. I, I possibly, mean, I am with you on that one. I'm, I will say though, I guess it's Have reality you? television. I like, I liked project runway. I like, I can watch some HGTV. You like crafty? You like crafty I, I, stuff? I like watching people do things. Okay. And I like seeing that they're good at it. I li- you know, I like, I find the baking show. Of course I like the baking show. Are you kidding me? That's right, like right, the right, baking right show is great. Come on. There's, there's also a, a glass blowing show. That's very nice. There's a, uh, and- come on. Yeah. The oh. Great British Glass Blow Off or whatever. I don't know what it's called, but it's also on Netflix. <laughs> There's an Antiques Roadshow kind of thing sure. called The Repair Shop on okay. Netflix where they where they take an antique, they bring it to this, this guy with a Cockney accent, and he's got a team, and they fix your chair or your doll or your clock. And they um, and then they give it back to you. Voila! And yeah. it's heart heartwarming is all fuck. So love yeah, it. Yeah, so I like watching people that are doing things well. I feel mm-hmm. that like really interesting. I don't like the side of it, and that's why the British Baking Show, we all know that we like that this for the same reason. It doesn't have that like grossly, uh, like completely ridiculous competitive aspect where people are willing to make asses of themselves because they know it will give them more film more camera right, time right 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 there's there's no one going well what do you think about this how about if you lose what about if you lose what if you lose exactly you know yeah yeah and so and i just giving I, people heart attacks yeah i remember uh i remember watching um a version of top chef in canada uh, a few years ago, I was in Canada seeing some family and I was watching. I was like, oh, they have Top Chef Canada. Of course, they have Top Chef Canada. And there was there was the first episode of the series and there was one char- one person, I'm calling them a character because I think they all are characters, <laughs> who right. was immediately snarky and talking about how he was better than everybody and dissing this person and putting down that person and just being so over the top. And of course, from my now versed in watching American reality television, I, I looked at them and I go, well, that's, that's the guy who's the star of the show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's and, what they want. That's what they want. And he wasn't very good. And they all tasted everyone's creation at the end of it. And he did not score well. And he was cut. Like he, and I was like, oh, my God, Canadian television doesn't understand reality. <laughs> Doesn't understand ratings. That <laughs> like, guy, you keep that jackass. <laughs> that's that's your guy. Now you yeah. just got these well-meaning people. You're sunk. <laughs> You're sunk. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so mystery. Do you have you tried any um uh a- any romance novels? So straight I, up, I, I haven't tried romance novels. It's so funny because I know so many people that mm-hmm. I really respect and love who I think who talk about them and say that, you know, there's great ones that I would enjoy, but I, I, as long as I need action, I need action. Yeah. Well, here's, well, and the, and the crazy thing is, is the, the best way I've ever heard it defined was, um, I read a nonfiction book about, about romance novels when I was trying to write a a satire of a romance novel. Yeah. And, um, and the way she put it, I forget what it's called. It was like bosoms and it was like it was literally like some sort of shit name to go yeah and she went to wellesley or she went to somewhere some fancy east coast college and she, she comes have. home and her mom's like what are you uh have you decided what you're going to study and she goes yeah i'm going to do uh, women's studies and women literature and she goes oh, are you going to read any romance novels and and uh she goes she says to her mom you mean those fabio books <laughs> and her mom said, you mean books written by women for women about women? You don't want to read any of those. <laughs> That's not your street, but, but yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. So, All right. And, her, and so she said to her mom, fine, give me a syllabus. And her mom gave her a syllabus and she now writes romance novels. And, um, there is, there's a woman who writes and this, I am sorry. Her name is Sherry Thomas, and I love her mystery novels. Yeah. Her romance novels are not great for me. Okay. Other people like them. Her mystery novels are epic. 
There, it is called. It's a, it's a Sherlock Holmes, a Lady Sherlock Holmes. I'm in. I'm one hundred percent. Oh, that we you. just we crack the code. We might have cracked a code here because here's the thing: the the fifth one just came out. Okay, I and, love this. Uh, that means there's more in my future. It's yeah, li- it's right? dynamic and living. And um, it is Sherry Thomas, and it is what the hell? Let me. Okay, the Lady Sherlock series. It's out by Penguin. The first one is uh, is called, and the thing is, is they're sort of, uh, they're the first one is is sort of a, uh, you know how whenever anybody does their own Sherlock Holmes series, they go back to Sherlock Holmes and just try to recreate the one of the stories, one of, and this one did not do it. It's called A Study in Scarlet Women. Is the first uh, one oh, yeah. study in okay. Scarlet Women, and I it's love set that Vic- title. And it is about essentially an autistic woman who is Sherlock is Charlotte Holmes. And she does not, she's like, I, she's, she's sort of, uh, she's gentry, right? So she's not a fancy lady, but her family is poor. Her, um, and she's like, I, and she is, uh, eidetic. She has like an eidetic memory and she has all the Sherlock Holmes things in Victorian England. Guess how that works out? And she's like, I can't, uh, I can't oh. get married. I don't want to, it's not good. And so she makes a deal with her shitbag father that uh, she will try. But if it doesn't work, he will give her her dowry, essentially, to go to school so that she can get a respectable job um, as like a headmistress or something. And right. um, yeah. And so it it it's like, it's such... And it happens in the beginning, so I don't think it's a spoiler thing, where she's just like, he reneges on it. <laughs> so she um, decides that the only way that she can get out of him just marrying her off is if she loses her virginity <gasps> to a married guy. So she, he can't make the, the person marry her. So she picks just some dude that she knows and gets laid and gets caught. But she wasn't, she didn't mean to get caught. She meant to use it as blackmail. But she got caught, so she gets banished. And then things happen and she becomes Sherlock Holmes. I love this. She is, this, it's my favorite. I'm reading the, the sixth one just came out. The first one's amazing. The third one's amazing. The fifth one's great. This one is amazing. So two. So I think two and four were just good. Right. Fine. I mean, I mean, I would if someone yeah. said that about watching my act, I would be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking with Ophira Eisenberg. And uh, I have to tell you, this is just it's been a freaking delight. Oh, my God. Um, I didn't know that I was going to get so much um, help. I know that. Oh, my <laughs> It's you. I, I read almost anything. And a lot of it is only to stop the voices. Yeah. So, oh my goodness, I'm going to get this should, Lawrence Block thing for sure. Yeah, we should uh, in a different life, or maybe this one, we should uh, open up a bookstore and redo the categories of books based on this kind of stuff, which right, is the emotions that you wish to feel when you read it. Right. Exactly. My 95 year old uh, great aunt loves cowboy romance novels, and so when I buy, when I go to a Barnes and Noble and I buy. I'm like, what are the new cowboy romance novels? And I try to get her. I don't, uh, she's 95. Yeah. So I try to, and she likes modern romance novels. So I try to find one where, you know, it's essentially, you know, it's, it's a Hallmark Christmas movie, essentially. Like some, some woman who's a CEO has come back to her hometown in Montana and and the sheriff is an old flame. (laughs) And she's got to, you know, deal with her father's, you know, ranch. Affairs or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. And she's like, she's like, I just need to sell this ranch and get back to my life in upper the west side of Manhattan. And she ends up, you know, falling in love with the sheriff and getting laid. And they end up, and she's like, you know, I'm going to stay here. And yep. uh, what I like about, um, I think I did a Jen Kirkman Hallmark Christmas movie one where she was like, my favorite thing is that they don't stay. They always go back to New York because she has the good job. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Someone's got to pay these taxes. Exactly. <laughs> this is a, well, we'll keep we'll, we'll keep it as the second house. And yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to I'm going to have to hop off. But listen. Yeah. 
Okay. I'm this just has read been amazing. all of these things. I'm going to read right. all these things. And everybody, look forward to Ophira Eisenberg's new album coming out on 800 Pound Gorilla. Uh, listen to mine. Feel free to buy the download when that happens. I think you it's today it. that it's available for do- for buying. And then uh, and then just a month ago, when this comes out, uh, Lori Kilmartin's album came out on 800 Pound Gorilla. We are so, so lucky. We are super lucky. Uh, thanks for being on the show. And Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. Thank we. You. Why don't we just call that as the end of the show?